Welcome to Lockbox, a podcast providing real estate professionals with action items for success. My name is Jeffrey Broger, and I'm going to be your host. I'm the founder of two real estate marketing and tech companies, Steezy.Digital and RealNurture.io. In this podcast, you'll learn from top 1% real estate and mortgage brokers the exact secrets to their success. Welcome to Lockbox. Welcome to Lockbox. My name is Jeffrey Broger, and I am here today with Curtis Wood. Curtis, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So why don't you start off by telling our listeners who you are and where you're from? Well, my name is Curtis Wood. I was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, which is Northeast Florida, home of the Jacksonville Jaguars, who get most of the number one draft picks every year um, because they stink. Um, (laughs) No, big fan. We're pulling for them to turn it around. So, you know, but um, born and raised in Jacksonville, uh, currently live in Ponte Vedra, Florida, which is just north of St. Augustine, our nation's oldest city. And um, met my wife here. We have kids. Uh, We do the whole family thing. And that's about it. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you, you know, saying that, talking about where you're calling in from. And that was funny when you said the Jacksonville Jaguars get most of the number one draft picks. Cause I was like, if you know anything about sports, that means they're typically towards last place. <laughs> <laughs> so, the second year. We've got it two years in a row. Jeez. Yeah. Well, uh, much love out to the Jacksonville Jaguars. And, uh, you know, I'm curious, you're doing some very interesting things in the real estate space today, but before we get to that, I am very interested in what was your first exposure to real estate? Like what, what was that first story seeing the power of, of being on, it seems like you, you gravitated more towards the finance and and lending side, but you know, what was that first exposure like? I bought a house uh, in the late nineties. I'm showing my age here. I sold it out of sheer luck right before the crash of 08. Okay. And um, that was my real first exposure to, uh, you know, going through the process and everything. Believe it or not, you know, the process hasn't changed very much from 20, 25 years ago. It was another reason why we're doing what we're doing. You know, we feel like we can change the process, make some improvements. But um, I got into the very early days of lead generation back in the early 2000s, this before Google AdWords. Uh, This is when cost per click was uh, just coming on the scene. There were companies like Find What and Overture. And um, from there, the industry changed, kind of consolidated. And I went to work for a software company building mobile apps. And um, I cannibalized myself. Uh, They had a better strategy. I voted for it. And uh, after that, I got into mortgage lending. And uh, Mm -hmm. I was a loan officer. So I just kind of naturally fell into the role. I love it. And really quick, I'm going to stop you there. So at, at what year was this when you made transition into becoming a mortgage loan officer? 14, 15. Okay. So you sold your primary residence right before the crash. You saw the, the turmoil of the crash. And oh, yeah. during that time, you got into tech. Yeah. And, and then about after about, what was it? Six years, five, six years. Then you trans like the, the real estate market has recovered. It's, it's on this now upswing and, and you decided to get into the finance side of real estate at this point, about 2014. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah so and go ahead and continue. I just want to clarify that. Yeah, it was a good shift. Um, just kind of personally, I was, I was faced with kind of a career moment. The industry had consolidated to go out West. I was East Coast. My family was here. My kids are here. Is that and, the tech uh, industry? Yeah. So, yeah, that's what you're referring to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So at the time, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my late thirties and I'm talking a full career shift and it was scary, but, um, sure. you know, when, when you look back, you, you know, call it fate or destiny or, you know, whatever, but, um, I landed on my feet in the mortgage industry and, you know, there's, there's something, you know, you, there's for everybody involved in the transaction, especially if it's a first time buyer, it's, it's exciting you know, they buy their first home, their dream home, hopefully it's their dream home, but, you know, pushing them over the goal line, getting them into that house is, is what is really exciting, you know, from the finance side. Sure. I I can imagine I have primarily been on the marketing and sales side, but you know, the finance side is obviously a massive role. And honestly, most consumers don't do the research 
this is tons of studies that support this. Uh, even Fannie Mae came out with a study that said, you know, most home buyers fail to research their mortgage options until they have already selected the house they, they want to buy and they've already committed to an agent and all these other things. It's like, that's putting the cart before the horse. You should probably yeah, they, go, they go, go get pre-approved. They, <laughs> if they find out they have champagne taste and a beer wallet. <laughs> that's that's never fun. So yeah, I, I've always advocated to uh, you know, go get pre-approved first. And and actually a lot of my lead generation funnels or agreements with clients that do co-marketing is to have the mortgage loan officer generate the buyer leads and have yeah. them get pre-approved before sending them to the agent. And the agent can focus on listing leads. So yeah. it just works out much better. Yeah. I can see how that solves a number of problems for the agent and for the loan officer. And, you know, just overall, it sets, it sets the proper expectations for the buyer from day one. And what you, what you alluded to with um, that Fannie Mae um, research, that study. That. Mm-hmm. You know, we're trying to build some of that into the app, just education. And thankfully, there's there's a generation of first time buyers who do like to do research, you know, whether it be Reddit and they're they're in these groups or, you know, whatever. But, um, yeah, that's a pain point that um, you're smart for solving, especially in your process before the agent gets a hold of the buyer. You know, the buyer knows exactly what they're qualified for, what what they can genuinely afford. Um, But but we're also targeting, you know, uh, those pain points in what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So now we're at about 2014, you're jumping into the mortgage loan industry, you have switched careers from tech in your late 30s. And, you know, how did, how did that go then? That was about eight years ago. So you know, it seems like you had a, a successful career in that area. And, and now you're doing some interesting things. So what, what was that process like, you know, beginning in the mortgage loan officer industry, but coming with this lens from the tech industry? Like, what, what was that yeah. like? And so I started out as a, a mortgage loan trainee um, and they trained us from the ground up. I was working for a company called PHH. Uh, they were sold to Aquin, so they're no longer around. But PHH used to do white label loan origination for all the big investment banks on Wall Street, you know, Goldman, Merrill, just Morgan, all of them. So they had to have just exceptional uh, controls. And, uh, you know, uh, compliancy procedures and controls in place. And the foundation for any mortgage is a compliant and defect free 1003 or loan application. So in order for PHH to keep these contracts in Merrill Lynch, they had to make sure that everything was in place. Everybody was doing what they were supposed to do. And this problem in the mortgage industry is there's a lot of people cutting corners. You look back to 08, you know, it's a big, big cause of the prime. Uh, feelings or the subprime feelings. So mm-hmm. thankfully, when I got trained, I was trained from day one on how to do it right. And one of the things I very quickly realized coming from my my software background is that this job as a loan officer, particularly in the pre-approval process, is extremely repetitious. It is the same thing over and over and over again. And what I would do for the mobile app company that I worked at, I would configure a mobile app for a unique type of customer that visited a small business. So I really had to configure it to meet the customer needs, which the small business was supporting. So coming out of that and then going into a loan officer role, I instantly realized that this could be done uh, in a mobile app. Hmm. Even in 2014, 15. Easily. Yeah. And people were asking about it too. I'd have customers call me on a weekly basis. And if you think back, you know, in in 15, this is when mobile apps were exploding. They were everywhere. Right. Right. And um, PHH is a multi-billion dollar company. After that, I left, I went to TIAA. When PHH shut down, TIAA is a Fortune 100 company. They might be a Fortune 50 company at times. None of them had a mobile app for their mortgage department. And if you think about it, you know, consumers have an, an on-ramp to buy cars, buy stocks, to bank with, all in a mobile app, to ride share, Uber, okay. And I mean, a mortgage was just like a natural partner, but it, it just wasn't there. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and so I'm sure in the beginning of your mortgage loan officer career, 
a lot of new hires in certain industries have great ideas and they want to implement, but they get stifled by leadership that's trying to teach them the fundamentals and the principles of how things are done and how things should be done. So, you know, what was your experience then transitioning from being kind of like a newbie in the mortgage industry to then having experience and authority to now go build that mobile app? Well, I can tell you this, there's a lot of really smart people um, down in the chain at big companies and they have Mm -hmm. great ideas that they really do. And, um, you know, corporations get so big that a lot of times those, those voices just aren't heard. I certainly was one of those voices, but our very first employee who my wife and my, my business partner personally recruited, her name is Angie Liu. She is our uh, senior VP of design and strategy. She built the app and she worked for Capital One and their mortgage division. And she had a ton of ideas. And just like me, they, they, you know, just do your work as you're told. So thankfully we got connected to her. And I know I'm not really answering your question, but, um, you know, we got connected with some people who had some ideas and weren't heard. But um, I'll tell you this, um, I had a light bulb moment when I was at TIAA. And back in 2018, blockchain was a buzzword. Everybody was talking about blockchain. So when I started to research a smart contract, I very quickly realized that it can do the exact same job that I do as a loan officer in a pre-approval. It intakes data, it decisions it, and based on a preset of qualifying conditions, it renders a decision. Okay, you're either pre-approved or you are not based on your credit score, your income, your DTI and your LTV and your assets. There's no real gray areas. You either have enough for an 80 percent LTV or you don't. 80 percent LTV is this rate. Okay, so all of that type of decisioning criteria can easily be pre-coded into a smart contract. And if I am no longer needed as a loan officer to process a loan application, then what we have is the technology needed to power a true mobile mortgage. This is one where you can do entirely on your phone and you're not waiting on a loan officer to process your loan application. So that was my light bulb moment there on the tech stack. I like it. I like that concept that once you understood the inner workings of what a mortgage loan officer did, ingesting that data, comparing it to a set criteria and having it be so black and white that, okay, you're either approved or you're not, you realize, whoa, this could be coded into logic and rendered instantly at a million people a second, essentially, that are entering this data into an app rather than having it be, you know, missed call here, voicemail there, following up and all the things it takes weeks to get the same thing done that could be done in 60 seconds. Yeah. And we, we've tested this out. I mean, our, our app is in beta right now and we can do a full pre-approval. This is not just a pre-call with a soft credit pull. This is a full tri-merge credit pull and a full 1003 completion, except for the subject property because it's a pre-approval. So the subject sure. property is TBD. But we can do this for a single borrower with verified income and assets in less than eight and a half minutes. Wow. So how does that work with banking? Because with with me, I'm about to buy a house right now, tax season. We've already been got, sent everything and the kitchen sink to our lender. And now that tax season's here, we have to do it again, right? And so how does that work with your you know taxes, banking? Are you using, I know that a lot of online systems use Plaid, I think it's called, where it links banks to like QuickBooks and you like log into your Chase account and it automatically pulls all of your stuff. You know, is there that type of functionality or like, how do you, how are you doing the financial part of it? So we're using Plaid. Oh, awesome. I've also used the work number. I've used Form Free. The work number is an Equifax product for income verification. Uh, Mm -hmm. Form Free is a count check, uh, very similar to Plaid asset verification service. To us, Plaid offered the best customer experience, okay? And we are all about creating just the ideal mobile user experience, okay? Keep in mind, all of these technologies are new. They've only been Mm -hmm. on the scene maybe less than five years, but um, they are going to advance, so they're going to get better, okay? We're using Plaid for income and asset verification. 
we just ran another test customer through the app today. Same thing, hooked her up, income and assets, fully verified. Plaid is Fannie Mae Day One Certainty approved for their assets. Uh, we hope they will be soon for their income. All indicators uh, indicate they will be before we launch mm-hmm. our product. And the significance of that, and I don't, I don't know your personal, um, it sounds like you had to produce some tax returns, but um, there are some self-employed borrowers who do have to produce tax returns. Sure. Um, there's an OCR program that can read a 1040 and read it very well. Uh, it can't do it with K-1s yet. But what we have estimated, we are able to automate with technology. So there's no loan officer needed to review the documents are all the W-2 borrowers and the 1040 borrowers. Well, that's around 80 percent of a, you know, a a production pipeline for a lender. The remaining 20 percent are the edge cases. These are your problem files. Maybe there's a bankruptcy, something, you know, in the public record section, a lien or something like that. But if you just think about it, I mean, if we have loan officers and processors who are who are no longer required to touch 80 percent of their pipeline, that is huge cost savings in terms of automation. And Definitely. we'll be able to offer uh, lower rates to our customers due to these cost savings. I don't know. I'm sure you've seen rates. They just hit five percent. Mm-hmm. The Washington Post just quoted me today um, about where I think rates are, you know, in everything. So, you know, our our target market is the home buyer who's looking for a mobile experience and they're looking for a, ro- a low rate that's competitive. Got it. And you mentioned 1099. Or sorry, you mentioned W-2 and self-employed, but what about 1099? Yeah, same thing. 1099 self-employed. Okay. So you would consider that self-employed. So a real estate agent would be the same as an entrepreneur, like a owner of a marketing agency or something. Okay. As long as there's no K-1s, it's all the same tax returns. You know, the, there's an OCR program can read. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Super interesting. So you seem to, since the 2014 transition and then 2018, you know, blockchain the, and the, the hyper blockchain, is this progression towards you know what's about to be available to the public, which is B, right? B yeah. mortgage app. That's what it's called. When is the anticipated release? About six months from now. Okay. Uh, we're going to open Florida. Was is our home state? Florida is my backyard, you know, so to speak. It's in beta right now. We're testing out live customers, live live mortgage apps, and um, we'll open Florida. We'll probably run there, scale there for about a year. Uh, then we're going into California, Arizona, Washington, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, some some good high production states, you know, uh, to operate in and everything. Awesome. So I know that my mortgage loan officer listeners are thinking one question right now, friend or foe? <laughs> <laughs> we're a friend. There's the mortgage market's like $5 trillion. There's, there's plenty of market out there for everybody. In True. fact, if you, but will if you mortgage loan officers use this? Like it'll, it'll help save the day and like save time, or is it going to replace a lot of their transactions? So for the self-sourcing MLOs, and I'm talking directly to uh, the people that work with the real estate agents, the LOs that have relationships with agents that are feeding them business, we are building a program at B that's going to let you retire in 10 years. We have not rolled it out yet. So the incentive to join us is going to be pretty darn hard to pass up. So it's not join or die. It's <laughs> you, you, you have your book of business. We're not trying to steal it. But if you bring it over to B, uh, you're going to have an end game in mind. Pass, you know, it's a, unlike if you just continue to self-source your deals and you're doing great, it's great money. Don't get me wrong. It is a fantastic living. But most likely 10 years from now, you're still going to be working. You're going to be right. looking at production at the end of the month thinking, whew, I made it, but now I've got to do it all over again the next month. Right. Yep. Retirement is one of those subjects in real estate that is talked about more often nowadays. Uh, One of my mentors and a a broker in my network said it beautifully. He said, how many real estate agent retirement parties have you been to? None. Same with mortgage loan officers, right? Yeah. uh, So with newer cloud-based operating systems for brokerages and apps like this, it seems like that's a common trend to have in mind is to give these real estate professionals an exit strategy, which they've never had before. Nope. 
Yeah, and it's not going to be open to everyone. We we can't bring on every single self-sourcing MLO. Just the way we're incentivizing them, and again, this is in stealth, so I can't go into details yet. Sure. We're going to test it out in Florida, and if we get a lot of interest, we're going to roll the same model out in California and whatnot. But, you know, it's if you get in first, it's it's going to be beneficial. Awesome. Well, good to know. We'll definitely look out for that. Now I'm curious about your entrepreneurial journey. So it seems like you've had some success across industries and that leaves some clues. So what's the single most important action that you take on a daily basis that you attribute most to your success? Accountability. Okay. What do you Accountability. mean by that? Success is the team's. Failure's yours. They're not mm. going to blame anyone. My investors won't look at anybody else and blame them for a failure except for me. So Elon Musk had a great phrase. And he, he said, you know, if we succeed, it's the team's fault. If we fail, it's my fault. And, and that's absolutely right. And, you know, every single day, whether no matter what business you're in, no matter what job you're doing, you got to be accountable for yourself for your own actions, for your own results. You can't put them off on anybody else. And honestly, I feel like in our our day and age, uh, it's becoming easier and easier to blame anybody else except for yourself for anything you feel like not taking responsibility for. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur, if you're going to go out there and you're going to earn the confidence of an investor's money and you're going to look them in the eye and you're going to take that check from them, you better be accountable. It's not up to anybody else except you. That's really good advice. I really like the concept that, you know, it's the team's success and it's my failure and having that level of accountability. It's something that it gets talked about pretty often, but it's much harder to do in practice on a daily basis. Just to remember when someone's giving you praise, not to just accept it as your own and and maybe you're in a, a group meeting and someone's complimenting your new product launch or whatever it is near the team lead. It's like, oh yeah, thank you so much. But instead having the mindfulness to give glory to the team. Yeah. And then on the flip side of that, when all hell is breaking loose and customer tickets are flying in and there's something that was forgotten in onboarding or whatever, being able to own that and say, this is my fault. I got it. Yeah. That's yeah. much harder to do in practice. Sounds great, but it's much harder to do on practice. So I, I uh, agree with you. And that's, uh, it's admirable. Yeah. Well, you got to think, don't think more of yourself, you know, because nobody else does. <laughs> We're all thinking about ourselves, you know, what's in it for me, you know, it's just that self centered kind of concept. Robert Greene has a really good book called Mastery, and he talks about thinking outwardly. And if we're going to build a mortgage app that our customers love and it's real easy to use, I'm not building this to my specs. I'm listening to my customers. And I did this on the front lines as a loan officer, took all their complaints, you know, and that sort of thing. But one of my proudest moments was our third co-founder is a guy named Matt Offers. And he and his wife just had a baby. So he went out and Angie stepped up to the plate. And when he got back, Angie got some credit for had the team's performance while he was gone. And Angie said, I didn't do anything. The team did it all. That's how we want our culture to be. And uh, honestly, that was my proudest moment. Love that. That's awesome. That's a great story. So being on the cutting edge and in helping to innovate the industry with your app, you know, where do you think the industry is heading? Like what, what trends are you, are you tapping into? What are your five, 10-year projections for what the real estate transaction will look like? There's two trends, the consumer trend, consumer habits, and there's tech, technology. And if you look at current mortgage technology, uh, it's like putting a Band-Aid on a broken arm. It has mm-hmm. not fixed the customer journey. It has not solved the friction in the structure, the inherent uh, structure of the transaction. And the reason for that is you cannot take a loan origination software off the shelf and configure it to meet new consumer mobile preferences because loan origination software is dependent on loan officers and processors. So we're having to rebuild the tech stack from the ground up. And we've looked at every single mortgage tech LOS in the industry. None of them can do what we, none of them has the the capability to support our, our envisioned 
journey for the modern mobile buyer that does everything on Uber, Carvana, Fair, Robinhood, you know, all, all of that. So, you know, if you don't eliminate the loan officer and the processor, you haven't fixed anything. Mm-hmm. And um, where I see the industry going, it's, it's headed in one direction. And I mean, that's towards mobile dependency. There was some data that just came out while we were all locked down in 2020. People were locked inside with their desktop computers and their laptops and their tablets. But they, they were using their phones even more for everything. During that time, whether it's laziness, I don't just feel like getting off the couch or whatever it was, but the data is there and it's trending to mobile. It's it's not stopping. Gen Z is the first digitally native generation, mobile generation. That says something. You know, my kids that were just here before we jumped on this, they can do things already with, with the phone, the tablet. It's in their DNA. Any, mm-hmm. any type of customer transaction that involves non-mobile is going to be shunned 10, 15, 20 years from now. That's where we're headed trend-wise. And there's also data, if you look back, you know, if, somewhat if you look back, you can predict the future. If you take the top 10 lenders today, five of them weren't around 10 years ago. That's a big shift. I don't think five are going to be around 10 years from now. Hmm. Those are some very astute predictions. Can I ask you a difficult question? No. Mm-mm. Okay. We'll, we'll go to the, the softball <laughs> yeah, <go> question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> There's an argument that with subsidized student loans, the government made it too easy to accept debt. And that has led to the huge, I mean, just absolutely astronomical student loan debt bubble that we currently have. And so- yeah. If we're giving consumers the capability to get pre-approved for the biggest purchase that they'll ever make without the, any type of consulting from a professional, is there inherent risk involved in giving that access to the market? I'm going to say no, and here's why. Um, while Dodd-Frank did a lot of clogging for mortgage companies, more documents, while it caused more doc harassment for the customers... Dodd-Frank did a lot of good. And what it did do was that it eliminated these liar loans, these loans that were given to people who did not qualify. It's one thing to turn over a pay stub. That's a manual step. I've got to find my pay stub. I've got to give it to the mortgage lender. It's much easier to do it with Platt. It's right there on your phone. It's one thing to physically hand over a bank statement. It's much easier to do it with Platt. The controls that are in place now are are very robust. If you look at subprime that was in the system before 08 compared to now, now I think it's less than 1%. So that's good. And granted, you're never going to be able to eliminate all of fraud. Somewhere, some body's cheating. Okay, that's the way it works. But we haven't exactly given them access to any other loan they would not qualify for with another lender who's doing another process. We're just simply automating it. The checks and balances are still there. Hmm. Speaking of student loans, we're a nation of debtors. We just are. That's, Credit card that's what debt. America's built on. It's how we've grown so fast. Credit, baby. Credit. Yeah. Okay. So, and I've had student loans, but like with any uh, applicant, if your loans are in deferment, they're not even counted against your DTI. So there are two sides to what you're saying. You know, we, we just burdened a generation with student debt. And that is true. Okay, if you want to go to college, the college has set the price. If you want to go to this college, you might want to take out a loan if you don't qualify, you know, for a ride, for a full ride, a scholarship at some point. So the government and HUD, they saw that this was happening and they took some steps, you know, to uh, not prevent these people from, you know, qualifying for the American dream and buying a house, but certainly it's something that's going to, that's going to be addressed. And there's smart, reasonable sides to it, you know, just like there is to just about everything where, where it ends up at. I have no idea. You know, I I know that I know Biden's forgiven a lot of debt now where it ends up at for student debt. I have no clue. We've put a lot of thought into student debt. We honestly can't come up with any solution for it. 
other than the solutions that are in place right now that we feel are pretty reasonable. Sure. And I think you said it best in the first part of your answer, which in other words, you're not giving access to loan products that would cause someone to be higher at risk than if they were to go through the full manual paper process today. It's the same products that you're giving them access to on the end. Essentially, they could more quickly go get denied for 50 loans than if they were to just go push all the paper to 50 mortgage loan officers for those same loans. Yeah. And that's a great way to think about it is that we just have a faster way to get denied. Right. And so in, in, in that regard, it does cause a lot of clarity for me to look at it like, oh yeah, that's true. It's, it's not that this is having someone make a financial, major financial decision that might put them upside down without any type of counsel. They can go make that decision and, and just get denied and be given some resources to maybe get their credit back on track or do this or that. And it's not any more risk than what's already happening today. Right with them just walking into an office and giving their their papers and saying, "Hey, can I get approved for this?" So that makes and, sense. And I will tell you this: education is is big in our our design. There's a generation that will self educate themselves. They poke around online, like I said, they check out Reddit groups. Not only that, but this is a a sharing consumer. They share experiences. They share rides with Uber. And they share references, reference links with Robinhood. You know, referral links are just very popular. So we're actually integrating those two types of features into the app for first-time buyers. There's going to be educational links for first-time buyers, YouTube videos, whether or not it's our content or just somebody else's. You know, it doesn't matter. Just get educated, you know, and, and so on before you make your decision. That's awesome. And that's smart that you're tapping into the virality of sharing. You know, I give you one insight from the founder of Dropbox. I was listening to Masters of Scale, the, the LinkedIn founder, Reed Hoffman's podcast, and and uh, the founder of Dropbox was talking about how they were going up against you know these behemoths like Google Drive and you know all, all these other options out there, for free cloud storage at the beginning and then paid after. And uh, first, what they realized is they needed to make their user experience seamless, and then they needed to make sharing it seamless. And yep. their anticipation of their first draft of their sharing process ended up when they tested it themselves was so difficult. They had to like go through and click these certain things and copy paste this here. And it was just ridiculous. It's way too burdensome to expect a, a layman consumer to go share that with their friend. So that was the first thing is optimizing the sharing experience. But the second thing was coming up with a incentive that was non-monetary. And so yep. what they chose to do was a you got one gig free. You know, if you shared it and someone else accepted and started uh, an account, you got another gig free. A gig of server space is like, you know, pennies a month for them mm-hmm. instead of giving them $5, which initially Dropbox started out giving them $5 and they were just shelling out money for free accounts that it, it just, the, the cost was far greater than just giving an, a double the storage space which to the consumer is actually more valuable and it costs Dropbox much less. So um, that's smart that you're tapping into that. And I'm sure you're thinking about those things. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, I've, I've read about uh, Reed's launch. I didn't read that, um, but that is very cool. We have, uh, how do I say this without giving away what we're doing? Um, (laughs) We are tapping into the sharing economy So in a mortgage transaction, if I get a mortgage and I refer you to the same lender, the lender cannot pay me. It's a RESPA violation. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we have a way, we have come up with a way and we were, uh, we are so excited about this. We're pitching investors. There's no way for us to protect it. Any lender can do it, but they're not, but it taps into the sharing economy. It will come back in brand promotions just in spades for us. It directly impacts our mission of improving the wealth gap. And at the end of your mortgage transaction, you are going to be feeling great about what you have done. Not just because you got a mortgage and you bought the house you want, but you have helped somebody else do the same. Hmm. Sounds awesome. Yeah. Sounds like you're working on some very inspiring uh, mission-driven 
solutions for for the world and and you know that's how companies truly achieve scale you're an elon musk guy another thing that actually elon's wife said was that if you want to truly build a great company a a fortune 5 company like tesla or spacex stop thinking about how to make a million dollars and start thinking about how to help a million people yeah and it seems like that's exactly what you you and your company are doing which is phenomenal to see yeah yeah, our, our core mission is to do something about the wealth gap. I, I agree with Ray Dalio. I'm a big capitalist, but I agree with Ray Dalio. He says this is the crisis of our generation. And it seems like with every single coronavirus or 08 recession, you know, it disproportionately impacts the lower end of the spectrum. Mm. And the one good thing about our economy is that if you work and you make good decisions, you can go up in classes, you can go up in wealth and earnings and build your wealth. Mm-hmm. Well, for a majority of people, this starts, all, all of wealth creation starts with home ownership. It's the nest egg. So the question then becomes, how do we get more people in homes? Well, the cost of getting a home is pretty steep. It hadn't gotten it's cheaper cheap. than it's ever been, especially yeah. compared to wages. So what we're doing is we are levering automation and new technology to lower the cost threshold to buy a home. This will help more people. We can't just only give it to low income people. That's, you know, redlining or whatever you want to call it, right. but we're offering it to everybody, but this will impact. And we have, we've studied this. We, the data is there. This will help people on the lower income end of the spectrum start wealth creation and, and that's something that at the end of the day of, you can feel really good about. It's not enough to take $1 and turn it into two. We need to improve the communities at which we're living. And if we can use technology in a mission-driven style of way to elevate the people who are getting impacted negatively by COVID and everything else, that's what we're going to do. Innovative and altruistic. I love it. Is there a question that I should have asked you or anything that you'd like to expand upon from earlier? I'm just lucky to be here. Well, I appreciate having you on. It was a very stimulating conversation talking about what the future of real estate looks like. And things are definitely changing rapidly. So it's an exciting time to be alive. And I'm curious how listeners can contact you. Well, our website is bmortgageapp.com. B is B-E-E. So bmortgageapp.com. My email is Curtis. C-U-R-T-I-S at bmortgageapp.com. If you pull up my NMLS, you'll find my cell phone, but. (laughs) You got to go to the NMLS consumer lookup for that. (laughs) If you really want to contact me, you'll. you'll (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Curtis Wood, everyone from B Mortgage. Really appreciate having you on, telling us the story of your transition from tech to mortgage and then back to tech to combine the two. Very fascinating and really excited to see this come to market. So you heard it on Lockbox first and I really appreciate having you on, Curtis. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. If you want to accomplish your real estate goals, then I highly suggest downloading my free Ultimate Real Estate Goal Setting Framework. The link is in the description of the show and it will help you break down your annual income goal into the amount of phone calls, appointments, or open houses you need in order to achieve that goal. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.